Uh, hello, everybody. So you, you've heard a great deal from me already, and by the end of today, you are going to be so sick of my voice, because this is the first of three events that I'm chairing. But um, I'm going to chair them by trying to say as little as possible, and you can hold me to that later. Um, a very quick introduction to... I'm not going to duplicate the information that you have in your packs about, about the people here today, because you can read that. I, I just thought I'd say very briefly how I met each of their work myself, because um, I, I, each of them is a, is a story. Helen and I have known each other for... A horribly long time. <laughs> well, thanks. Oh, no, um, no, no, I meant, I meant years <laughs> rather than... It's a joy far to know too you, long. Rob. <laughs> um, uh, Fifteen uh, years yeah. or more, probably. Um, and I think I, I met Helen's work before I met Helen reading Shayla's Fish, which is uh, Helen's collection of poetry. And... It, it just, it's, I still think it's one of the great collections of poetry of this millennium. I know this millennium hasn't been going that long, but it's, that's, it's just, it floored me when I first read it. If you, if you haven't, it is utterly astonishing uh, in, its, in its modernity and its poise and its agility and its grace and its strangeness. And, uh, and, and then I met Helen and she was all those things too. So I'm very glad to call her my friend and to be here with her today. Since then, she's become a global superstar. Uh, and that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> uh, Nancy's work I first met on, I think, terrain.org, which is a really superb web. There are so many good online journals out there, online essay venues. We were talking last night about media and uh, accessibility, but Terrain is a, is a really fantastic online journal and venue. And I, I read there an essay by someone called Nancy Campbell called The Library of Ice. And it struck me with its, uh, its play, its depth of knowledge, it, the movements it was making across media, the photographs there, um, within language, within forms of tone and voice. And I knew I wanted to find out more about this writer and, and, and artist and um, small press uh, maker. And, and, and so I did. And I, I'm, I'm very glad that I did. And we'll be hearing more from Nancy later today. And we'll be hearing from the book that that essay has grown into, yeah. The Library of Ice, uh, which will be out later this year in its full form. So. And Sarah Hall's work, I met, I hadn't read Hawes Water when I read a book called The Electric Michelangelo. And I read that book because that year I was judging the, what was then the Booker Prize is now the Man Booker Prize for fiction. And it knocked the judges' socks off and it with its its vigor and its voice and again its its deep idiosyncratic strangeness of vision and we had no hesitation at all in shortlisting that book for the Booker Prize and I have to say that I've now judged the Booker Prize twice and it, it's almost killed the love of fiction in me reading 300 books in uh, in I can't remember what it is about six months in total over those two judging sessions. But when I have wanted to go back and reignite a love of fiction, it's often to Sarah's writing that I've gone. And I've just finished The Wolf Border, which bears heavily on, on our discussion today. Uh, and it's absolutely astonishing novel. It really drew me in and through. And it thinks so hard in a way that only fiction can about some very, very contemporary questions. So um, I'm very, very happy to be up here these three. And we're going, to talk, um, we're going to talk today about crisis, about the Anthropocene, about what literature can do, should do, might do. We're going to talk about loss. We're going to talk about hope. We're going to talk about change and regression. And whether, in some sense, literature about nature now is inevitably what Tim D calls a singing in the dark times. And if so, what the nature of that song of nature is. The Anthropocene, among the many things it's rendered unnatural, as Jedediah Purdy observes, is nature itself. And so we're going to talk about modern nature and what that might be. Okay, we were told yesterday that our arrival here in Germany uh, was celebrated by uh, a wolf blocking the motorway near Berlin. Is this right? Or was this a, an urban myth? that a wolf strayed onto the motorway and uh, onto the autobahn. And is that correct? It was on the, it must be true. It was on the news. Okay. <laughs> so I thought we'd start with that extraordinary image of uh, the return of a, 
of a very, in a way, the creaturely epitome of the wild, holding up human movement, causing enormous inconvenience, but being, I think in this case, respected. And each of these writers has written a lot about human-animal relations, about transmigrations, transformations, so, and Sarah particularly. So I thought I'd start by asking each of them about their relations with, with humans and creaturely life, and start with Sarah and the wolf border, and what you make of that, that moment of the wolf holding up the motorway. Oh, I wish I'd seen it. <laughs> Although, not the traffic jam, that. Um, yeah, I, well, as you say, I think the wolf in so many ways represents all the challenges that we face in relation to conservation, ecology, scientific understanding of the wild, management of the wild, that paradox of you know us somehow now being in charge of absolutely everything, almost, um, and decreeing what the wild spaces might be and might be left. Um, but, and the wolf, the wolf itself, well, I should start by saying, probably for me, it was the very first talismanic animal that, that appeared when I was a child because I was brought up next to a wildlife park only about two miles away. Uh, this was the late 70s, early 80s, so before the sort of act came into place that shut lots of these old wildlife parks down because the enclosures were too small. And the lead enclosure in the wildlife park was a wolf enclosure, and there were three wolves in it, um, completely habituated, unsurprised by humans, very bored, dog-looking wolves. But to a five, six, seven-year-old as I was, uh, looking at a wolf that was looking back at you from the other side of an enclosure was extraordinary. And you sort of knew that you were looking at a superb, superior, perfect, charismatic creature, because they are, they seem perfectly developed in the world and are the most distributed of the apex predators, I think, um, can survive in cold, hot. They seem to epitomize everything perfect in the natural world other than what we be believe is perfect about ourselves. And so in that way, I think they've proved a challenge to human beings, um, the competition for prey and hunting, but we've also romanticized the creature, uh, understood it to be charismatic, brought it into our lives in ways that are sort of mythological. And so the wolf represents so many different things. It seemed the perfect starting place for a novel which was going to examine uh, our relationship with ourselves, the natural world, apex predators. Um, and this, this is the big challenge, how we live with the natural world. It's very interesting about the predators and the way we're drawn to these dangerous animals. Um, I didn't see the wolf either, and I seem to have a history of missing out on animal life. Um, <laughs> I spent a little while in Greenland uh, on a residency, and it was in the middle of winter, so it was very, very dark. Um, I didn't see very much at all, and so I retreated into folk tales and other people's tellings about animals. And there was a Danish Greenlandic explorer called Knud Rasmussen, who went on a literary expedition, he called it, in 1918, and he collected a lot of folk tales about Greenlandic life and animals. There's a wonderful one called The Old Woman Who Had a Bear for a Foster Son, um, which I did a retelling of, um, based around a bear that I did see, a polar bear that was brought into the harbor in Upernavik where I was living, but brought in dead, and trying to examine the how we can articulate the the horror of what's going on with these animals now that's caused by us, climate change. And the polar bear has become a kind of a talisman for change, almost a cliche, I think. I've seen so many in shop displays in England. And um, I sort of wanted to refresh that idea of the polar bear and bring back the knowledge of the people who first encountered it. There's a lot of uh, talk about the boundary between um, people and animals. But you find in Greenland that a lot of the stories, a lot of the artworks talk about the connection. So if you look at small ivory carvings, you look at them from one angle and they look like a standing man. You look at them from another angle, they look like a flying bear. There's no absolute truth about what that art artifact is. And the same with the story. It's a, it's a very shape-shifting country. Um, there's a lot of trickster behavior. And I think we could do well to acknowledge that in our own culture, that there's not this dividing line between us and them. Wow, wolves. Um, 
I thought instantly of a, a few weeks ago, I had the honor of opening an exhibition at the Turner Contemporary Gallery in Margate, um, and it was on animals and us. And uh, one, of the one of the exhibits there was a piece by Mark Dion called Wilderness. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a, a tiny trailer, a silver trailer with wheels that you put on a car. And on it is a, di is a kind of bit of earth and, and a stuffed wolf and some trees, this portable wilderness. And I thought that just was the perfect verse of the wolf on the motorway. Um, one of the other things in this exhibition was um, something which was, I found very poignant. They've crowdfunded um, a puppet polar bear, more like a pantomime horse, people are actually in the polar bear and it's walking around. It's very lifelike. And um, it's going to be used during the summer to walk around the seafront in Margate, this tourist seaside town, to educate children about climate change. And there's something about using a puppet, an unreal polar bear, to teach children about the presence of animals that I just, it makes me both sort of shiver with horror and kind of joy. It's a very, very strange, unnatural, natural moment. Um, but yeah, my, my predators are hawks. And um, again, I'm very interested in how they have been used to um, naturalize a whole bunch of human characteristics over the millennia that we've had relationships with them. And um, I, my deepest sort of sense about hawks is that if you know, it's very important, this is to do with my, my sort of sense of nature writing, whatever you call it, generally, is to try and understand the valuations and the meanings we have given to particular animals and why we have given them to those animals both because that illumines notions of value in terms of conservation, but also because there is sometimes a moment when you've worked out how much you've put into the animal, when you can kind of look past that and almost see the real astonishing inhuman creature in before you. And I think that moment of understanding the inhuman or apprehending the inhuman is incredibly important. Can you, can you remember a moment when you've seen past the valuation and the cultural accretion and seen the creature. I think that's, that certainly was the movement that happened when I trained this hawk, Mabel, and lived with her for many, many, many months and went kind of bonkers. And all of the things I saw in her, I realized that I'd put there myself. But towards the end of that year, I remember one day watching her sitting outside, um, sunbathing with her wings out like this, with a sort of expression of raw good humor on her face. And suddenly she wasn't my companion or a friend or a, even a bird. She was a something like a dinosaur, and that was the nearest I could get to it. And I realized that the joy of our relationship was that it was between two utterly different minds. And yet there was communication across there, and I thought that was astonishing. I should say for people who are not present in the room that every time you leave the room in which these events are happening and step outside, you're confronted with a stuffed bear in a large glass case holding a begging bowl. And I haven't been able to get to the bottom of yet of the story of why there is a stuffed bear holding a begging bowl. But it, it seems a remarkable sign under which to be holding some of these discussions. And I, I hope to report back later about, about why that, that bear is there. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about predator fetish. Yes. The wolf and the hawk, the falcon, have both served frequently as, 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 as fascist emblems and have been appropriated to embody as one of those valuations uh, a, a, a kind of ruthless, ready killing and a, and a might, a raptorial might. And I, I wanted to ask Wolf and Raptor what... what what, what we should do with that? Should, should we be trying to, rec always trying to pull, pull the creatures away from that valuation? Um, um, just to say that, again, I, I valued the, um, just spending time with a creature which is almost obscured by human meanings um, is one very good way of culling those meanings. This is why I'm, I'm very, very keen to um, encourage natural history in schools just to get children, people, close up with animals, close up in the, in, in the environment. Um, animals are always more complicated than the meanings we give them, obviously, and they, but they can also resist them. I mean, I certainly remember with, with this hawk that um, there were times when I would look at her and all those strangely problematic and deeply peculiar meanings about power and about strength, you know, and then she'd kind of, you know, 
squeak and play with a paper ball. You know, she would constantly undercut those. And I think, again, contact is, is, is one way that we can work against that. Yeah, I think historically people have always been interested in animal behaviour and there is an increasing amount of study into animal behaviour. And in some ways, people have always likened animal behaviour to our own human behaviour and still do, I think. Um, you know, the studies looking at wolves, there are, there are certain behaviours that can be observed uh, which we might still associate with ourselves even though I think the metrics have shifted and we're trying to look at things and analyze them slightly differently now uh, more scientifically but also understand that behavior in the context of itself things like you know the first time a female wolf goes back on a hunt with the pack after a litter has been raised and can be left uh, glee has been observed in in the kind of you know um, attitude of the female wolf you know she's back out there running hunting instead of raising the litter and of course you immediately think oh I understand that I've got a three-year-old uh, yeah the first time I put pen to paper after having a baby I understand it you know back to work back to the kind of you know industry of the self or whatever it is the kind of so I think we do still associate these things and I think it's been very easy to hold the wolf up as something intelligent that's always been known I think wolves run raids on other packs in in the night, in the morning, very organised hunts, but but actual raids on other packs. You know, there's a kind of warfare that might be associated with wolves, and of course, it, it, it's 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 its own thing. It belongs to the nature of the wolf rather than us. But I think you sort of can't help making that association. In some ways, it's a connectivity, isn't it? You know, we want to be connected with those other worlds, with those other creatures, uh, say they in so are in some ways like us. The more we begin to understand the intelligence of animals and birds and other species, the more we can perhaps try and understand them. But again, is it a good thing to have that connectivity, to want to liken them to us or, or disliken them to us? Um, and that's difficult, isn't it, the phenomenal phenomenology of animals I mean we can barely sort of get to grips with our own in some ways <laughs> so it's a very difficult subject very interesting it's it I mean we very often encounter this almost um, moral disapproval of anthropomorphism and for a long time I, I believed that that was the case that it was methodologically unsound that it was a form of projective colonial it's a great thing but actually it, it sometimes it is it is a necessary form of self-othering there's, there's actually to try to begin because the gulf that gulf that you took you months even to begin to to cross or to see the gulf to observe the gulf um it is so vast between us and and these other species um and res this very complex negotiation between respecting otherness but also finding ways of of of, of understanding of comprehending of beginning to pry into the enormous complexity when we when we when we simplify in our otherings, that that seems to me when the, the problems profoundly occur and when when they become vessels for the pouring in of problematic meanings, and that's why increasingly I see anthropomorphism as a sort of hermeneutic that is actually very, a very very useful a action at times. I don't know if that if that makes sense, and maybe that's there in the folk. Maybe that's what folklore is trying to do: is zoomorphism and anthropomorphism. Things are moving back and forth. I think so, and I think it's interesting to take that a degree further, looking at other aspects of nature. And I know you've recently written about an ice core, and seeing yourself in stones, in ice, in the hills, in the rocks, like like Helen was writing about, or the trees. Um, there are other voices there. It doesn't stop with with the creatures. Um, and um, thinking about your work on on the ice core and and your book that's coming up about about underworlds, underlands. Um, and I've been writing about ice, and one of the things I find really fascinating about it is when you go down to the pure science, it's made of, you know, we're all made of water. We're the same, essentially, as this thing that we see as completely other. Mm, that, that idea of what's increasingly called li liveliness or uh, in... Um a sort of vital materialism or a vibrant materialism that's um, much discussed, a, a way of extending the domain of life beyond the familiar categories where we're, we're happy to see it in ourselves, in creatures, in, in trees, in fungi begin to be more problematic, but, but soil, rock, ice, these apparently inert 
but agential presences. There's, there's all sorts of fascinating work being done now trying to extend the category life. But whenever I see this work, which fascinates me, I always think, look at indigenous cultures. They've, they've known this for, <laughs> for however many thousands of years, and their, their literature and their culture is full of an acknowledgement of the liveliness and reciprocity that exists between humans and the more than human world, non-human there's a, there's a very interesting article by Robin Walkimera called Grammars of Animacy, um, which you can find online. And she writes about her own rediscovery of, of her language, and, and the, which is an endangered language, a very endangered language. I think she finds there's only a few speakers of it left and a few people uh, learning it online on, on a forum. And this language, in this language, you, you say, Someone has passed this way when you're talking about an insect. You would never call a creature it. Um, and I think that's very respectful and, and yeah, something to be rem admired. One of, sorry, oh, I'm butting in. Um, one of the things that um, I have a rather visceral <laughs> response against is this notion of valuing natural habitats for the good mental health they might promote. I mean, this is, it, obviously this is a great thing, that if one get, walks in forests, one might improve one's mental health. But I think this notion that um, what the natural environment can do to you is just make your own self better, when I have this sort of feeling that, we're talking about anthropomorphism and empathy, that one of the things that it might do in a more particular way is that it might show um, the opportunity for, for other selves to, to be apparent, you know. Um, by being more aware of the kind of situation, if you're in a woodland, the kinds of creatures that are there, the kinds of networks that are there, the ways that things are interacting, that seems to me to be a way of getting bigger rather than getting better. Does that make sense? Or no? Yeah, yeah. The, the man, this idea that it becomes a sort of e another form of ecosystem service, a, a, yeah. a valuable natural capital, um, and it's it's clear that. Green places are, in the large part, good good places, except maybe where kudzu vines have rampantly or overtaken knotweed. or Japanese knotweed has uh, <laughs> smothered an ecosystem. But um, but I think there is this dangerous meeting point where where mental health provision becomes yeah. outsourced to uh, yeah. to na national forests. Right. So so sorry, I'm I'm talking. I've had a lot of coffee this morning. So um, so if you look at the woods near my home, we have a lot of uh, really rather beautiful woodlands. Um, and if you go for a walk in them, they look exquisite and healthy and happy. Um, you know, 20 years ago there were nightingales in those woods, but because we've have muntjac deer that have grazed the understory to nothing, those woods you know might look beautiful to us, but to a nightingale they're a desert. Why well, you need so a wolf in them to get the deer under control? <laughs> exactly, to get, the get rid of the muntjac. So there's just that sense that we, we don't we don't know what a, we don't know what healthy ecosystems look like, you know. It's, and I think one of the reasons I like this notion of understanding or related to other animals is that if you the famous Thomas Nagel comment, you know, what it's like to be a bat, you know, you don't know unless you're a bat. But the, I think the attempt is important. If you think what is it like to be a bat, what does a bat need, what does a bat want, it gives you a, a much I think finer grained understanding of the complications in the world. You know. yeah. Thinking about healthy ecosystems and trophic cascades and apex predators. I mean, so when you were researching the wolf border, I mean, it's, it, it carries its learning very lightly, but it's incredibly densely thought through as to how a reintroduction might happen, what would happen if the reintroduction went wrong or went right in this way, what happens when the wolves themselves take their leave of their enclosure. But I wonder if you could tell us a little about the research process, about coming to know that particular aspect of sort of predator-led ecologies. Yeah, um, and I, I'm by no means an expert, although uh, thank you for saying that about the novel. I think I probably don't carry the learning lightly, so any time I get the chance to bring out a wolf fact at a dinner party, <laughs> I'll do it. Wolves can swim eight miles, for example. It's, uh, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's very boring for people who are around me all the time, or at least it was during the years of the research. But... Um, yeah, I mean, exposure to wolves is difficult. Uh, I, you know, there are people who've gone and lived with wolves, <laughs> and I did not. So a lot of the research was academic. There's a, a, a very good giant book about wolf uh, behaviour, ecology and conservation, which I read. And um, I suppose with fiction writing, what you're trying to do is uh, borrow enough fact that you can then appear to be an expert in the writing. And, and um, But... <sighs> I mean, I, I, and you always feel like you're failing as a novelist too, somehow. I think 
I was trying to balance the ideas behind the book with, with the kind of plot and narrative, and that's, I think, something I should say quite early on, that the book, in some ways, has to propel you through as a, as a piece of fiction, too, as well as uh, c convincing the reader, hopefully, that they are in the domain of, a, of, a, a, of an actual project which is taking part. Um, alongside the wolf research, there was all kinds of research into, you know, who owns the land in Britain, how might these projects come about, is it all down to grand, uh, rich patronage, somebody owning a lot of land, um, an individual kind of millionaire's eccentric project, which is ultimately what is set up in the novel and perhaps might be the only way at this point of anything like that ever happening. Um, and beyond that, the sort of, um, I, and I should say the writing of the book took, uh, took place before the Scottish independence referendum. So this idea of borders was, was so much in the news that I felt like, and it was entirely relevant to the novel because of course wolves don't uh, recognize the borders that we do. The political uh, national borders uh, ha have, have not much to do with wolves. They will travel where they need to go um, if they can, even if there's a fence in the way, they'll generally get under it, over it, through it, however they can. Um, which is problematic in Europe when you talk about conservation, because we do need... Uh, th these are lots of ideas coming out now. But the research led me into all kinds of interesting areas uh, about the kind of political systems of Britain um, and beyond, uh, the power structures in Britain, uh, and, and it all comes down to who owns the land, really. Yeah. I think that's one of this novel's many achievements, is, uh, and what makes it very, very contemporary, is that it, it looks at... A, a key conservation idea, a rewilding idea, a, a, uh, an iconic species, the possibility of it returning. And then it says how complicated this is, how conditioned it is by ownership structures, uh, cultural presumptions, uh, and just the management needed to even imagine its possibility here. Uh, and that has something to do with Britain's status as an island nation, I guess. But I just wanted to go from there to back to something Helen was implying, this phrase, um, shifting baseline syndrome. Uh, you, do you want to gloss SBS? Yes, I think, I mean, my, the best illustration I've seen of that is a woman who was um, collecting photographs of uh, fishing trips in the Gulf of, uh, in, around, uh, around Miami. Um, so they went from, I think, 1950s right up to the present day, and there's a, a stand there where you would hang the biggest fish you've caught on the fishing trip, it's a tourist stand. And in the 1950s, the, the, the fish are as big as we are. They're all human-sized fish, you know, but wider. Um, and every single year, the fish gets smaller. And currently, you know, the fish that are hanging up there is the, you know, the record catch of the day are the size of a piece of paper. I mean, you know. And what's poignant about that is that, you know, as time goes past, the people that are fishing now have no clue that the fish that were there 40 years ago or 50 years ago, were huge. Um, you know, we, what we expect is what we, what we know in the present moment. Uh, my, the, the, another one, I, I, I went for a walk with my niece when she was about seven in a local nature reserve. It was running with life. There were cuckoos and drink em off caterpillars and you know, deer and barn owls. And she turned to me and said, when they made this place, Auntie Helen, where did they bring the animals from? Did they come from a zoo? And I was like, what? <laughs> and she said... Um, did they come from a zoo? Where did they get them from? And I realized that to her, the countryside is a place with no life. You know, it's a dead zone, very unlike the, you know, what it was when I was a kid. So it's just the sense that every generation accepts more and more depauperate, impoverished landscapes as the norm. And it's terrifying. And it's incredibly powerful. And when, when, you, when you see this concept and, uh, and, and understand it, and then see how far you yourself have internalized the shifting baseline syndrome. And then you see how hard it is to fight because how do you the new cut, normal. conjure back mm. what mm. was? And maybe that takes us to something that preoccupies all of us, which is loss and the function of loss in this kind of, of contemporary writing. Um, is, it, is it its task or one of its necessary tasks to remind us of the time of, pl of plenty, of diversity, and, and to make us feel that, that loss? And I just want to start with that idea of loss with ice, because ice is what we're, we're losing. It's a lively substance, but permafrost is now no longer a meaningful term. So I wondered if we could think about shifting baselines and loss and, and your writing and thinking about ice. Yeah, I think um, I found The Library of Ice an incredibly poignant and, and worrying book to research 
because I, I knew, having traveled in the Arctic and spoken to people in Greenland, how fast the sea ice is melting and, and the glaciers are retreating. But um, reading scientific studies as well is fairly terrifying. Um, I think I, I find it very hard to envisage the degree of loss we're facing. It's so catastrophic. Um, I can only really understand it in personal terms. Um, the end of a life, the grief for something we can't go back to. So a lot of my book is um, about human loss as well, or the loss of material objects. I write quite a lot about um, manuscripts disappearing or being lost the conservation of manuscripts, which is no longer feasible in certain environments. Um, so moving away from nature into the world we've created. Well, as we've discussed, ice itself is a manuscript. It's an archive. It's a storage medium. Uh, we've often, in the 19th century, people talked about the great stone book. There was just a very easy metaphorical recognition that, that the rock record is itself a kind of archive. It, it leaves history, I mean, leaves in the sense of places leaves on top of one another. And it, and it records, and it is now recording us. It is the archive that we are laying down now, the anthrop that will be the future rock record. That this is what interests Anthropocene stratigraphers. What mark will we leave behind? What will it minerally be made of? How thick will our stratum be? These are incredibly humbling, uh, uh, brave, confronting questions. And in a way, it speaks an international language, the ice, ice cores uh, being researched by, especially in Antarctica, which is um, divided along international lines, these invisible borders in the snow. Um, uh, many researchers are investigating um, the science of ice. Um, and that is disappearing, the ice is disappearing. But I think I'm interested in the loss of language as well. And your project, Lost Words, dealing with English words which are no longer being used commonly, but also um, indigenous languages that are disappearing. Um, and, yeah, I think it's very painful to know that our, our response to climate change is becoming more difficult because we're losing the traditional knowledge that's enshrined in languages that are disappearing because they're not being used any longer because of the global rise of English. Helen, loss, you yes. were you were furrowing your brow? I don't know. Uh, when, that's when that's I, my thinking face. That's the thinking face. When, Sorry, when I, I used remember. to interview at college, I used to pretend to say to people, remember that I used to say, this is my thinking face, I'm not judging you, so it's just me thinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for clearing that one up for me. Um, you were thinking, you are putting on your thinking face yes. when I was asking about, about loss and the tasks of loss and the registering of previous plenty and shifting baseline. What, what, do, you, what do you think literature, writing, culture can do here, should, should be doing? It's a tricky one. Um, you know, I remember my mother walk, driving around and saying this was all fields and when I was a kid I used to just think, oh, here she goes again. You know, <laughs> there's nothing, there's no, there's no sort of way in which that really does any work other than make you feel bored or depressed or bad, you know. But I do think that nature writing in Britain, um, as you were discussing earlier, a lot of the writers are in their 40s and 50s and, and older, and part of what they're doing is taking stock. They're bearing witness to stuff that's gone. And I don't know, I mean, personally, that is an extremely important thing, I think, to, to write. It's, you know, to, to bear witness to what's gone. Um, but I don't know how that... Um, that kind of movement um, is helpful. Um, it's like my mum saying, this was all fields. I think there's more we can do, but I'm not sure how it can be done. Does anyone want to make a case for, for the, the, the need to record loss or to show loss as a, as, a, as a force that does drive us 
well into the future? Well, it might just be opportunity as well. And this is just a very small anecdote. I'm not sure how it fits in, but um, a along with language that's being lost. I mean, if you, if you think about the kind of uh, folklore, I'm just thinking about flowers and birds. And I still have a very strong response when I see one magpie, which is ridiculous. You know, we have this old kind of nursery rhyme in. Uh, is it a nursery rhyme or just one, one for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy? So when you see one magpie, you really want to see another magpie very quickly. <laughs> Otherwise, you end up with sorrow. And um, I was driving along in the car the other day, and there are a lot of single magpies around at the minute. I don't know why, perhaps. Because Helen... the females are on their because eggs. They're okay. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The other so magpies are there, of... yet invisible. There are lots of silly rituals that you can do if you see one magpie, like to turn around three times and spit or say something. And I, I had this reaction driving along. My three year old daughter was in the back of the car to a single magpie. Oh, God, no, it's a single magpie. And she said, What's a magpie, mummy? What, what's wrong? And I thought, Well, in some ways, this is this is rich, isn't it? This is folklore and superstition, and somehow that's it's been active in a part of our brain for a long time. This need to somehow find pattern and meaning and and religion even in the natural world. What do I do at this point? Do I do I say this little rhyme for her, give her that gift, or do I not? Do I tell her something other about the magpie? Do I try and come up with some scientific facts about the magpie? Or as you say, you know. You know, the, the females are probably sitting on their nests. What is useful or everything? Do you just give everything? Do we make a choice about what to pass down? S superstition yeah. may serve no purpose, really, other than to you know, make us jittery while we're driving in the car and we see one magpie. L L or, or do we give that away? Do we, do we bring in more science? What do we do? What, it's almost like there are choices that can be made in some ways with younger generations. Indeed. And how do you, how do you begin I, to I, manage that? There's a very strange thing. Do you, do, I, I don't know whether you play Pokemon. Do you play no. Pokemon? So I've, I've been told that Pokemon uh, games on, the, on, the, on your smartphone were invented by uh, a Japanese um, entomologist who collected insects. And he thought, is there a way for kids to do that without actually killing insects? And Pokemon was born. Um, so it's that wonderful kind of naturalist's urge to collect and classify, which is being sort of strayed off into this computer um, game, this virtual game. And uh, a, years, a couple of years ago, I went um, to Henley-on-Thames, um, in the middle of the English imaginary, to do to go swan upping, which is this bizarre uh, medieval sort of uh, progress up the river in which swans are caught and they belong to the queen or to various livery companies and men wear red uniforms and it's all ridiculous. But so they were catching these swans from their skiffs in the in the mill pond at Henley, and there were two little kids with smartphones and they were catching Pokemon um, pigeons, which were aligning. There's just pidgeys here, and I said, look, the guys are catching swans, and they said, well, we're doing the same. Um, so, but there was something about that that oddly wasn't depressing. Um, there was a sense that, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to pass it, but it was, it was a very peculiar moment. Seems like, a, yeah, it seems an astonishing moment. And I think the version of the uh, Pokemon Go origin myth that, or story that I've heard, uh, is, it goes one stage of refinement further, which is that he, he was a, a bug catcher as a kid, and then as he grew up, the, the, the urban sprawl sort of overtook the place where he had caught. And so it was, a, it was itself a, a response to a, to a loss, but also a virtualization and a celebration of categorization, yes. exactly yeah. as you say. I wonder if that, that beautiful vignette of, of uh, Pokemon catching and swan-upping swan is, is a moment to... I asked each of the participants to bring... Uh, the participants, my friends, to bring... Um, friend participants. <laughs> friend participants to bring a text or te short text that might speak to questions of the Anthropocene, of modern nature, that somehow, they could be very old texts, were felt very contemporary. And I'm just going to see if Nancy might read from a text that some of you here, a book that some of you here will know called Modern Nature. Sure, yes. This only occurred to me quite late in my research it through my bookcase for what I would bring, and there are many other things um, I would love to read from. But this book, uh, Derek Jarman's Modern Nature, was a huge influence on me growing up. It was published in 1992. Um, I read it avidly. I haven't read it for years, and I went back to it a few weeks ago. Uh, it's a, a beautiful journal that he started writing when he moved to Dungeness on the south coast which is a very um, a rocky landscape. Um, his house was in the shadow of a nuclear power station. You always say in the shadow of, don't you? <laughs> <It w> <laughs> I think Dungeness is quite su sunny, so it probably was in the shadow of. 
Um, and he writes about um, his, uh, he had been newly diagnosed with HIV at the time, and it's a reflection on his whole life, but also the garden he started to build out of this, let's call it barren, uh, rocky wilderness. So I'm going to read from the very beginning, um, which explains why he called his book Modern Nature. There's two short entries. Thursday, 2nd of February, 1989. The gorse is a blaze of golden flowers forced by the wind into an agony of weird shapes. Twisted branches wrung out like washing. It's the only winter flower on the nest. Some of the bushes are six feet high, crowned with tight bunches of spines which creak in the wind. Other bushes cling to the ground, shaped in neat cones and pyramids which are clipped by the rabbits with the precision of topiary. Kissing is out of season when gorse is out of flower. No one need worry. Here it is always in flower. And the next day, Friday 3rd. For two months after moving here, I spent hours each day picking up fragments of countless smashed bottles, china plates, pieces of rusty metal. There was a bike, cooking pots, even an old bedstead. Rubbish had been scattered over the whole landscape. Each day, I thought I had got to the end of the task, only to find the shingle had thrown up another crop overnight. Sunny days were the best for clearing up, as the glass and pottery glinted. I buried the lot on the site of an old bonfire at the bottom of the garden in a large mound, which I covered with clumps of grass I dug out when I built the shingle garden. I was describing the garden to Maggie Hambling, who's a British artist who does a lot of work about the sea, at a gallery opening, and said I intended to write a book about it. She said, Oh, you finally discovered nature, Derek. <laughs> I don't think it's really quite like that, I said, thinking of Constable and Samuel Palmer's Kent. Oh, I understand completely. You've discovered modern nature. And I, I really like that encounter between two quite urban artists um, having a little bit of a cat fight about what nature might be to them and to British culture. Um, I also think that is quite interesting in the context of what we're doing, talking about what we're writing about now and how we're trying to find ways to write about the subject of nature. And um, just thinking of what was happening 20, 30 years ago, I couldn't believe when I read that. I just actually attended the screening of the film Albatross about all the plastic in the ocean, which is a devastating film. And here was Derek Jarman writing about trash being washed up from the sea on the south coast in 1989. Yeah, no, just, just to say um, that, that sense that you know, our understanding of the countryside in Britain is so utterly swamped by constable and landscape paintings from, you know, from the past that it, as you, it often obscures, you know, as you say, the, the trash and the rubbish that are going on. That was quite a trite point, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a bit from um, a paper by a woman called Jennifer Fraser, and it's on um, the death of natural history. And it's a very, it's a very good article, I recommend it. Um, Online, you can find it quite easily. In schools, environmental education has often replaced natural history with its emphasis on general structures and concepts like food webs or trophic levels. But such vague ideas are often boring and abstract. It would be hard to think of a kid or a biologist with a passionate devotion to a food web. But how many can you think of with a passion for a particular bird or dinosaur? This kind of education and lack of exposure to life in the field produces kids for whom every evergreen is a pine, all brown birds are sparrows, and if a spring chorus is to be heard at all, a frog is a frog is a frog. On a re recent fishing trip to southeast Oklahoma, our guide related that he'd had a client who wanted to know what all the trees on the hill were that still had their leaves on in winter. 
In shock, my guide realized this man had no idea what a pine tree was. When the guide discovered the man worked in real estate, his interest was piqued. How could a real estate agent not know what a pine tree is? One that works in commercial real estate, apparently. On my old blog, I related the experience I had right out of college when I worked in a plant nursery and a man came in looking for an ostrich fern. As I sorted through the five or six fern species we had, he remarked, I never knew there were so many kinds of fern. There are 10,000 species of fern. When kids do not grow up around natural history, they become adults who are not only ignorant of natural history, but who do not care about nature and view it as disposable and unimportant. Ecological ignorance breeds indifference. What we know we may choose to care for. What we fail to recognize, we certainly won't. Few reactions to climate change irritate me more than the disposable Earth attitude, surprisingly common among young adults, that if we ruin Earth, for our uses at least, it's no biggie. We can just go terraform Mars or something. Um, I just think that, that sense of is the terraforming Mars thing is just terrifying, and I hear it everywhere. You know, oh, we'll, we'll run out of everything here, we'll just skip off and fix it, we'll go and live somewhere else. But we know that the people who will skip off are the, are the ultra-privileged. I exactly. mean, that this is the, the disposable planet is also a disposable people vision and, and a sense of the elect experiencing a version of the rapture. They are lifted up and they are relocated to, to the place where life can continue with... Um, Underground. Uh, <laughs> and, ab well, D Don DeLillo in his most recent novel says the subterrane is where the advanced vision is realized. And you think, actually, yes, when we go down, we often go forwards. Though we think, though we think we're going very far backwards. Um, there's so much to say about those two readings. I'm going to pause before asking Sarah to, to read her reading of choice. So maybe we could just go back to Derek Jarman, first of mm. all. It, it was amazing to hear that. And I was, I was thinking, what a... This, this is before the idea of the notion of the Anthropocene has been coined, but around the time when Bill McKibben is publishing The End of Nature. And what a motif that is, not just for Britain, but for, uh, as we say, a modern nature. The making of a garden out of bits and bobs of jetsam junk. And it reminds me of Donna Haraway's current phrase, what she calls staying with the trouble. She says, we, we, we need to not fetishize a lost world. We need to stay with the trouble. And by that, she means a kind of pragmatic, adaptive, but not non-sentimental, but also non-technocratic response to the complexities of life as they surround us, which doesn't simplify and essentialize nature into a, an out there salvation but sees it as this, this complex thing that makes us and that we are making in a kind of ongoing bricolage. So it was, am it was amazing to hear that. Uh, and I thought also about your, your, The Wolf Border, so it's the novel I keep coming back to, but it's, it seems to centralize so much of the discussion. In a way, that's about the making of a garden. Yes, it is, yeah. It's a sort of, not prelapsarian exactly, but there's a sense of um, a, 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 an Arcadia that could be recreated. A, with a huge fence. A, with a huge fence and a really huge fence because they need to be very large and they need to be angled in and they need to go down a long way. Um, a wolf-proof fence, which they're very difficult to make. Um, yeah, exactly that sense of uh, if, if you have enough money, if you have enough power, if you have enough land, you can, you can create a kind of project. There's an interesting film called The Village, I'm not sure if you've seen it, which, uh, same sort of, um, yeah, is it, uh, who's the director? Yeah, it's a China. It's a crazy film. Um, yeah, all about human suffering in some ways uh, and wanting to kind of cut yourself off from the world and go back to a more innocent, naive way of living uh, within the kind of suffering world somehow. Um, and I think in some ways the, the, the Wolf Border project is that too. It's a sense of um, cutting yourself off from suffering somehow as well uh, by recreating a, a naive and more beautiful and complicated world. Um, Although and there's, there's, there are two wolf reintroduction projects going on in the novel. One is, one is in Cumbria and requires the creation of the circumscribed garden. And the other, so Rachel, this uh, wolf specialist who's the central figure of the novel, She's, she comes from a much, a very different kind of project. And did, I mean, you contrast those. And yeah, she's been working in North America, so on, on the, the proper reintroduction projects where there are free, free roaming wolves, you know, uh, hard releases, 
um, and is convinced, in the premise of the novel, she's convinced to come back to the Lake District where she's from, uh, where an earl <laughs> is, is setting up a much more kind of domestic version of that. Um, but, but the idea of rewilding Britain is so exciting to her because she's British that she can is I, can lured back towards it. But um, yes, so the great in, you know, reintroduction schemes are generally North America, where they've been seen as successful and also problematic. Um, and uh, in some ways, her, her life begins to shrink somewhat as she's overseeing this new project. Um, and of course, you, in a novel, you can't set up a wolf enclosure that seems to be wolf tight without, you know, later in the book, letting the wolves out and, and seeing what happens. And that, that actually is the third reintroduction project, which is the sort of basis of the whole novel. Um, have they been let out? Have they got out? What's going on? What is the grander scheme beyond uh, an, a fenced enclosure? For wolves, it's it's a much it's a much larger and in some ways dangerous and in some ways noble. Who knows scheme? Um, but reintroduction is problematic in some ways. I mean, it's 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 complicated business. Um, the premise is good. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of conflict involved um, somehow, and I suppose that's what I was tr trying to get at. The uh, how sound are the ideas? Are they scientific? Are they romantic? Are they both? How do you negotiate between those two things? I was, I was going to ask, actually, I'm fascinated by this sense that, that rewilding in one, in, in one way is this, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a better functioning ecosystem to be kind of thinking about it. But, I mean, there's something also very interesting, I think, about that, that desire to turn the clock back to some imagined golden age. And in some respects, rewilding sometimes seems to be a bit Brexit. Um, I just wondered if you saw any connection between rewilding attempts and this notion of going back in time to a, a better yeah, age. It's, it's it's difficult. I mean, I think I think I think it's no both in some ways because a lot of it is science based, although hasn't always been. I, yeah. I think there has been a kind of romantic notion behind some reintroduction schemes, which haven't necessarily been totally well thought through. Um, I think things move towards a more scientific understanding and realm. But yes, I, I do. I mean, I think there's an idea of. Uh, a, a, a kind of more glorious country that we once were in terms of biodiversity, and this is true. I mm. mean, there was more mm. biodiversity in Britain. Um, to get rid of the last wolves in Scotland, the forests were burned down. The final solution, to get rid of wolves. Um, extraordinary, extraordinarily short-sighted, but also, you know, an understanding at the time was not there that w what that huge loss of forestation would, would mean. Uh, so I think it's it's really really complicated and and difficult um, and there are writers far more expert than I. Uh, but uh, in terms of Scotland and birds, this is what I'd like to ask you. I, I'm I'm wondering whether land creature and air creature, not to say that birds are entirely air creature, present uh, a different premise for reintroduction. And in some ways, we've moved towards eagles in Scotland. When yeah, we'll I mean, but there land have, animals, it's there going to take have much been longer. issues with white-tailed sea eagles, which um, have been reintroduced to Scotland. Um, that was a again, and what's interesting about that is a lot of the, um, as far as I can see, a lot of the um, anger or ire that this seems to be coming from um, local inhabitants who are not happy about these schemes is the sense of that they're being imposed by a, a sort of British English-based conservation organisation. So. Um, there's definitely sort of cultural factors, social factors involved in that. Um, but yeah, birds get, birds, birds get it easy, don't they? I mean, they tend not to eat livestock very often, and, they, um, and they're pretty. And birds are pretty. I mean, one of the things I love about the, the, there's a lot of red kites in Britain now. They've been reintroduced. Um, it took about 20 years ago they began to reintroduce into England. They used to be all over the place, but um, they were shot out by gamekeepers. Um, and a little tiny remnant remained in Wales, in central Wales. When I was a kid, you know, to see a red kite was like, you know, that's a lifetime experience. And in the, um, in the 80s, they decided to reintroduce them to various points in, in mainland, um, sort of England and, and, and the borders and some parts of Scotland. And it was fantastically successful because it turned out the only limiting factor for, for um, kites in Wales is they didn't have enough food. Um, they were eating kind of the shed tails of lambs and things like that. Um, but there was a lot of, un uh, of controversy about it. And I recall reading some stuff from the Welsh kite groups explaining that the kite was the bird of Glendower, that they were the Welsh, they were a Welsh bird. And English, English nature were like, no, they're the bird of Shakespeare. So these, you know, th this was... But we have a situation now where there are kites everywhere. And um, I think that those big reintroduction schemes with raptors, I think it's wonderful, but it tends, I think, to obscure the terrible loss we have in small, un you know, insignificant birds, farmland birds. So... Corn bunting, skylarks, woodlarks, you know, um, mm. lapwings. No, another 
motif of British modern nature at the moment is if you pass near the, um, the meat packing factories of the Cotswolds or the pork pie factories of Melton Mowbray, you see kites in spirals of 200, yeah. 300 birds circling above the factories because that's where the scraps come out, that's where the scent is, is coming into the air. And it's astonishing. I've never seen big raptors. Wingspan, six, six, six foot, and a half. Huge, yeah. yeah, yeah. Really yeah. big, yeah. gorgeous, And they steal birds. children's ice cream in playgrounds, <laughs> <laughs> apparently. I mean, it's, it's glorious, but it's, it, you know, the, 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 talking about baseline syndrome, so yeah. you know, we have many birds that have appeared in Britain over the last sort of 20 years, possibly to do with climate change, like certain kinds of egrets, for example. Um, great white egrets have started appearing. There was a squacko heron quite recently. I remember going to a place that I've been going bird watching for many, many years and finding it unrecognizable. I felt I was in Spain. And I think that sense of um, childhood bonding to a particular landscape is in some ways quite an insular way of looking at the world things do change and yeah yet, you know i found that difficult and the wolf has been gone for centuries in yeah. britain that's the other thing it, it exists in mythology and nursery rhyme and the sort of imagine irrational imagination which has no comprehension of, of what a wolf is what it does what yeah. it doesn't do what it might do if it's put close to sheep um and conservation for wolves is so problematic because the, the, in one country there might be uh, protected st status but no compensation for damage and so those two things aren't working together even within you know one country in europe um, but the, the, the idea of them interacting with us and not interacting with us is also problematic because they do and they also don't. Uh, yeah. Today is um, World Oceans Day. And Chris Jordan, who is the filmmaker and the photographer who took the photographs of albatross chicks on Midway Island who had died because their stomachs and digestive systems had become so filled with seaborne plastic debris that had been uh, fed to them by their parents that they had died and then rotted, their bodies had rotted down around them to leave this corona of, uh, of dead seabird, the, the bird of greatest freedom arguably, around this, this Anthropocene detritus. Many of you will know those photographs. They, 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 they've had a huge impact. Um, today, I've tweeted about this this morning, but today Chris Jordan's film Albatross is free to uh, download online, is free to view online, and he is giving it today and indeed on other days as a, as a gift to the world. So uh, you, can, you can find that online by looking for Chris's Albatross film, which is what Nancy saw recently. Um, and I wondered, I'm thinking about the ways we, outsour we, we offshore loss as well, that, that loss is not just something that happens or damage is not just something that happens in our landscapes, perhaps where it's harder to see, but where it's most charismatically visible, where shifting baseline syndrome doesn't affect us so much, is on somewhere like Midway or Henderson Island. Uh, tell us or, about the film. Or in the middle of the ocean even. You know, I don't think I can talk about that film. It affected me so deeply. I saw it on a on a narrow boat in, in East London, there was a very intimate screening with 20 people. And uh, Chris Jordan is encouraging people to hold their own screenings at home. And I would really recommend seeing it with close friends. Um, everyone on that narrow boat sat in silence for about at least 10 minutes, I would say. It was so shocking, um, but worth seeing too. Um, I think it leads on quite interestingly to communicating uh, climate change and pollution and, you know, making sure that people know that pine trees exist and, um, yeah, what our role is in this. There's um, a red, I can't remember the name of the environmentalist, but there's someone at the moment who's sw swimming through the plastic in the ocean to raise awareness and he'll be testing the ocean at the same time um, for plastic and testing fish. But it's very much about playing the media as well with this slightly horrifying image of going in a wet wetsuit through this uh, microplastics and also quite large amounts of plastic. And how do we do that as writers? How do we capture that horror and the fascination of what's out there now that we can't see? Well, I do think that's often where fiction comes into play because, you know, speculative fiction, science fiction, you can create these worlds of the future um, in, in horrifying detail and hopefully 
in a dimensional way that will affect people and will con convince them, not necessarily of what might actually happen, but what might happen. Although I wonder whether there's now kind of a saturation point in the entertainment industry for, for these kind of, uh, you know, apocalyptic films, which, which, which are, they are, they are entertainment. I mean, I mean, Albatross sounds in no way like, uh, what is it, the day after tomorrow or something, which, you know, these, these sort of images of tidal waves hitting uh, skyscrapers in the main cities uh, has become almost kind of cliche now. But it's so hard and large to process um, these things. It's, there's a sort of cognitive dissonance to the whole thing. We exist now, we try and make small changes, we do as much as we can. Uh, where are the larger networks? They are in existence, but where are the global networks? Um, coming back to the wolf again, where are the international corridors for these wolves to move when they need to move? Um, how do we work together? It's so large, it's almost too large to digest, to sort of metabolize. Metabolize. There's a, the cultural theorist Sian and Guy comes up with this spatchcock portmanteau term that I, I like. Uh, she, calls, she calls this experience the stew plime. She says we live in an age of the stew plime, and that, that bashes to, crashes together the, the word sublime and stupor, stupefaction. And she says, we're, we're horrified, we're astonished in a way that exceeds the grasp of our imagination by what we are doing, what is happening around us. Henderson Island, eight million tons of drift plastic, um, hermit crabs making their homes in, in dolls, plastic dolls' heads that have washed up. And yet, we feel, as in the traditional sublime, we feel concussed by this. We feel concussed into a stupor. She says we experience this as a series of minor fatigues, and I think it's that, it's that granulation of the experience of shock that leaves so many of us in a state of, of helplessness rather than hopefulness. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it's uh, I recently read uh, The Last Man by Mary Shelley, which is uh, does what it says on the tin. Basically, it sort of proposes a sort of cholera-like epidemic sweeping across first Europe uh, and then the world, uh, and we're reduced to one man, which of course is a trope which has gone forward into The Road and by Cormac McCarthy, lots of films, uh, lots of other writing. This, this, uh, um, the, uh, uh, ooh, what's it called? Z for Zachariah, which I read as a child. You know, one woman left on, on, on a farm in a valley that has somehow been unaffected by nuclear fallout or, or, or uh, whatever's happened in America. And this idea that you are set alone against it all, I think is also what's happening having to process all the knowledge that we have of the vastification of the world, which might be underway and is underway, uh, it, it somehow reduces you to a kind of singular, paralysed being somehow. In order to process things, you sort of imagine yourself as the single last person left in the world, often, I think. I think Mary Shelley, it was a remarkable work. I'm not sure quite why it didn't enter the, the consciousness in the way that Frankenstein did, because it's an extraordinary uh, book also imagines a British Republic, which we don't often see in literature. But that's another, that's another seminar. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to try, if I can, to get to Midway, actually, to talk about just this thing. I, I think that if you want to write about the, you know, this, this particular combination of shock and guilt and horror, I think you know, guilt is what albatrosses are made of for us. So um, I'm going to try and write about that. And I don't know how yet. Um, and I'm thinking of playing around with the sort of fiction, non-fiction boundary and pulling a bit of science fiction in there too. I mean, I think um, I think it's going to be terrifying and horrifying. Are but we allowed uh, to talk? Are we allowed to talk about the fact that this is yes, yeah, absolutely the subject of Helen's I hope next book. Um, um, do you want to tell us? A little yeah, bit more I mean, about I, th I think of Midway as um, something like the you know the pin in the middle of the, the the clock face around which the sort of 20th century is swept. This tiny coral island in the middle of the Pacific that started off, it's a non-incorporated American ter uh, territory. Um, it's had a cable station on there. The island is full of not only albatrosses, but apparently uh, yellow canaries that were the pets of cable operators in the 19, uh, you know, 19th century, late 19th century. Eight, no, le <sighs> early 20th century, sorry. Um, and it's like a sort of J.G. Ballard, you know, if you, if you go onto the internet and look, it's kind of destroyed naval, ba you know, old naval buildings that are falling apart and these amazing people that are trying to keep the reserve going and 1.2 million albatrosses, um, which have been returning to the island despite this horror of plastic. There's one there called uh, Wisdom. I think she's around 58 years old, going back to the same place all those years. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's going to be a book about the end of the world, basically. Um, you know, another cheerful subject for me. But um, it's, it's kind of the, it's the front line, I think, for me, that, that island. And um, 
I really want to meet the people who are desperately there working their socks off, helping maintain the island. And I think w in preparation for sea level rises, in fact, I, um, albatrosses are being moved from Midway onto the mainland in Hawaii to start a new colony of lazy albatrosses because everyone's aware that um, you know, Midway is not going to be there forever. So it's, um, yeah, well, it's terrifying. <laughs> it's going to be fun, but scary. We'll, um, we'll open to questions in um, a couple of minutes. I just wanted to ask Nancy one more question about, I was very interested by your account of watching Chris's, Chris Jordan's film, and you said it was unspeakable, and you don't want to talk about it now, and I'm not going to ask you to talk about it now, but I wonder if you could s step back and think a little bit about the nature of this grief, what we might call something like Anthropocene grief, which seems to be an internalized wounding on behalf of the planet. And there's clearly perils of piety to do with that. I, I will take on the stigmata of, of the earth that is suffering, though I am mm. also the inflictor of those stigmata as, a, as an individual. I mean, also, not just butt in, but I mean, I think the thing about albatrosses and midway is the horror of it is this terribly Freudian thing of these, you know, these wonderful parents, you know, doing their best to feed their chicks and, and uh, killing them. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. And, yeah, and the guilt thing is a great symbol of guilt. Um, but I... Could you, are you able, are you prepared to talk a little about the nature of that feeling and, it's, and how far guilt, blame, shame function in that feeling of hurt? Really hard to talk about, isn't it's it? It's really hard to talk about. I think I've been, I mean, it's the journey of my life, really. I'll just lie back on the couch here. But you know, I've been through, I was such, I loved the environment as a, as a young child and then as a teenager I began to read WWF reports about things going wrong and in, the, in, the, in the 80s and then it, there's been a slow realization it seems through my lifetime of the urgency of the situation. So I don't know if I've internalized that. Um, but we all, we do have a culpability. I don't find it, um, a very constructive emotion to write out of and I find grief a very difficult emotion to write out of and I think in a way grief is something that one has to work to live with if one is to keep living um, so I suppose maybe moving through that the next stage is to look to hope and joy and what we can do while we're here um, I wanted to just briefly mention a project by Elizabeth Jane Burnett, who is a British poet who has been wild swimming. And she's just published a book, Swims, with Penned in the Margins Press. And I, I love this book. She, um, she's, her poetry is quite conceptual, and she did, I think, 12 wild swims in different rivers around England. And in one of them, she asked her friends and other writers to send her some words to write on her swimming costume about the, the, the sort of the situation now. And I think this relates back to something you said about the loneliness. And I, I love the idea that collaboration can somehow be a way to move forward through this. And um, Elizabeth writes very beautifully about this piece. And, um, you know, paraphrasing her, she says, is this activity really going to do any good as activism? Me putting on a swimsuit and going into the water and then emerging again and seeing which words survive that immersion. But at the same time, it's a very beautiful piece and it's a piece that really captures the public imagination, I think. And, I, and the poem that came out of it starts um, with three columns. One, the words that were given her by her friends and one, the words that remained at the end of the swim. So there's a sense of loss there. But there's a column in the middle in which she writes her own feelings about, about the state of the river and her experience of swimming. And maybe we just have to be there in that experience. Okay, at that point, uh, I'll open to, to questions uh, to everyone here. And if, if they fall short towards uh, the end of the 15 or so minutes we've got left, I'll, I'll ask Sarah to read... Um, 
uh, a poem that she's brought, but uh, that's uh, not to compel you to fall silent. You can keep talking as well. Okay, so we just need a, a roving microphone. Uh, first question, Elke. Uh, I just have a, a, a comment on the Berlin wolf, um, because the, obviously that was a wolf not, um, disobeying the border, uh, the motorway, and it was um, stunned and killed because it got injured by cars. And so uh, tr um, a wolf um, probably coming from Poland, not a Berlin-born wolf, but uh, trying to live in, in Brandenburg. Um, and uh, uh, this wasn't, wasn't known in uh, Bavaria, but Bavaria has its own story with Bruno the bear. Um, a few years ago, a, a young male Italian bear left the Abruzzen in Italy and crossed the Alps at 200 um, miles per day or so something like that. But, uh, and um, it was killed um, really by order of the state. And uh, in both cases, there's a little hysteria about it. I, I can see it in the, uh, on Twitter and uh, in the Berlin papers about the wolf, and certainly with Bruno, um, there was state mourning here uh, for a while in Bavaria about uh, about this story. Um, uh, all this is written about a lot. There, there are actually other uh, stories. For example, Simon Faithful is a, um, a visual artist who um, has uh, traveled the Antarctic, and he um, has worked there on a film installation because the sea lions, or um, um, a major sea lions, uh, really l large scale um, um, animals, are taking over the whale stations, former whale stations. Uh, the whale hunters have left uh, some time ago. Their villages are there. Uh, so the, the animals are actually entering the, uh, the stations and live there. Quite dangerous for the filmmaker trying to return and, um, uh, and document this. But a uh, very successful story of these large animals to have taken over what humans have left behind. Thank you, Elke. Well, that seems to bracket the story of the wolf uh, very, very appropriately. It breaks our rules, it gets wounded, it gets stunned, and it gets put down. On that cheery note, another question. Uh, there's one at the back. Yeah, it's me again. I'd love to talk with you about the wolf and the bears, because those were the topics I was reporting on often about as a journalist, but there's only short time left here. So um, I think the concept of loss is, uh, is important that you were mentioning. It was a great discussion. Thank you for this. Um, we have the great philosopher Bruno Latour, who has just published a new um, theory about, um, and it's a kind of interesting social theory, bringing back the place in the whole climate debate. Um, I only know the German uh, translation. And uh, apparently one of his friends committed suicide because of climate change, just in, these, in, in the month before he has published his last piece. And I think this is something we should much more talk about and also write about, is this concept of environmental harm. You were talking a lot about being touched, suffering. So we are allowed to cry when we lose a person, a car or a house, but not when we lose a fox or a wolf. And this is something that plays a role, for example, in deep ecology, Joanna Macy or others, mm -hmm. other thinkers. But to, to be angry, to be touched, to, to be really sad, that, that's what you were expressing a lot while discussing. This is something we should, I think, share much more when we write as writers or journalists. So because it's, it's really the, the, the deep going effect of, of loss. So what so maybe you, you could... Um, th is this my, my yeah, uh, I, I, I just yeah. Th that, I mean I think that the the death of the wolf is extremely sad for you know environmental reasons. Um, it's sad for the wolf. Um, I think it's interesting that one would want to cry for a wolf and not cry for the billions of chickens or cows that get. I mean I I, I just find it very interesting the way the way we we would take that wolf as meaning something human to us. It's a you know, it's something from over there that's trying to make a life and... And, yeah, and I don't it's know. one wolf, it's not it's a Russian wolf. super pack of wolves, which right. probably there would be a different response a to Russian if super they arrived pack. at the... <laughs> but yeah, so I think, I think it's just interesting to always, always think about, you know, if you have an emotional response to a, an animal death, to think about where that fits in your own emotional economy, um, political and social economy. Yeah. But maybe there's a different kind of loss as well, where you're losing not just a single, well, there is a different kind of loss, where you're losing not just a single entity, single being, but a, an ecosystem. Right. So what does that loss feel you're like? You're losing promise. You're losing the promise of a 
of a Bavaria full of wolves or a... Yeah. Yeah. Or, 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 or even, I don't mean just that that single death is symbolic of a much larger possible death. I mean, the actual death, I mean, the shifting baseline syndrome that shows us that we are losing whole ecosystems. Mm -hmm. What does ecosystem distress syndrome yeah. feel like? Yeah. And there's this very awkward language of loss and pain, solastalgia, Glenn Albrecht, Australian philosopher, doing his very best to give us a language for grief, psychoterratica. Mm. They're ugly words, they, they stick in the mouth, they stick in the throat, but then so does the feeling. Um, yeah, and there's loss and then lost, and I wonder whether some part of us psychologically has moved past the idea of loss and we have moved to lost, we are lost, we've lost it. The idea of getting off the planet it doesn't really matter if I recycle this bottle because we are lost. And so, you know, it's very frequently, again, anecdotal, uh, hearing reasons for, for people not wanting to have children because we are lost. Why would you have children? Why would you bring children into this? We are lost. There's nothing we can do. And so it, it does begin to affect the behaviour as well, I think, if you feel everything is beyond you. Hi. Um, I've really enjoyed all of your writing of luminous prose and beautifully constructed narratives. And I wonder now, when we're talking such a lot about loss and grief, whether you see any, any danger in this aestheticization of, of grief and loss, whether there's a, a danger in people reading these texts which are beautiful and feeling edified and turning away again for something else because the, the aesthetic experience is kind of on its own, precludes action, I don't know. I don't know if that's to me or to everybody, but everybody. Um, Nancy, your turn to speak. <laughs> that's an, in, uh, an interesting one. I, um, I can completely see that as a point. I'm a, a terrible, bad polisher of language, trying to get it to be as beautiful as possible in order to do its job. But I can really see an argument for writing something a bit more edgy and ragged. Um, I did a, a, a quite a conceptual installation project recently where I, um, rather than writing myself, I invited members of the public to give up words. Um, it's called the Polar Tombola, and it was a way of kind of imaginatively trying to create a space to think about loss, lost languages, lost, um, lost ideas, lo lost species. So I think maybe we do need um, to use our imagination as writers, not just to create these beautiful artworks, but to think about how to symbolize um, what's happening in broader ways. Yeah, I think positive narratives are always very helpful. You know, rearing children, positive narratives and encouragement. <laughs> Uh, it's a good it's a good tool, but also I mean you begin to wonder whether we hear less about eco terrorism now as well, don't we? I think because uh, uh, feel uh, there's less of a spearhead now that, and more of a kind of generalized feeling of well. We are conscious of the fact that things need to be done, but yeah. you wonder whether the place of militia is still there. So it's, it's hard not to read that with the sort of five stages, stages of grief, right? So right. We've, 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 we've gone through the anger, and now we're at the you know, depression. <laughs> 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 yeah, and resignation. I mean, it's, it's scary. Hubler-Ross for the planet. Um, I, I think there's a danger in separating a thesis hard from ethos and ethos hard from polis. Uh, I, 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 do, I do not see that as a smooth or easy continuum, but nor do I see those as categories separated by bulkheads. And my own uh, tiny experience of that with, with the lost words has been to fill a book with something like wonder, something like hope, with spells that taste good in the mouth, that speak to the heart and the mind, at least as we wanted them to do, and then to watch change flow from that in a way that I could never, ever have anticipated. And I think coming back again and again to the idea that literature works in a condition of uncertainty. When, it, when it's very certain about itself, it, it becomes propaganda. And um, we need table thumping. We need pulpit thumping. We need political change. To me, that's all part of the, the wildflower meadow, the diversity that, it, that is needed. But there are, there are forms of touch and change that are brought about by literary works that are not furious, that are sad, that are hopeful, that are strange, that are witty. And if we, if we exclude all those kinds of change 
because we think that they need somehow to be more angrily urgent, all of them, then we lose something very powerful as well. It's my hope, anyway, that may be just a writer reassuring himself. Oh, hold on, I think the mic is maybe not. No. Do you want to borrow this one, or can we send the working mic across? Sorry. Does it work now? Great, okay. You've been talking a lot about this shifting baseline syndrome and about young people. And speaking as a sort of young person still, I would say I have a very different perspective of that because um, a lot of us are very aware of the fact that our future will look vastly different than how we have grown up in childhood. And we experience nostalgia. I have that with the place that I grew up in. It's not recognizable to me anymore because of land grabbing and other like industrial urbanization projects. And that is just speaking as a citizen of the global north. So of course, it's a wholly different story in the global south. And I'm sometimes wondering what happens if we promote this dystopian vision. Like some people have also mentioned this, that there's a sort of dystopian fetish going on and reveling in this destruction. And if we only um, promote that narrative of everything is going downhill anyway, then it's not going to inspire anyone to become active. So I'm also trying to look at what do we gain from climate change. And in a sense, I think there is something to gain. It's like the society has been sick for a long time, but it's never gotten to the point where it was so bad that we came out of the denial phase. So if you're imagining having a depression, for example, you will have a long time of coping, of sort of dealing with it, of never being really happy, and it has to get really bad for you to realize, oh shit, it's not working. So my hope is that climate change can provide this sort of shock that instead of um, paralyzing people, gets them to become active, but they can only do that if they see a way forward. So if we say there's no hope, then that's not going to happen. And in the best case scenario, I mean, it can be a reunifying factor. Um, this is the thing that concerns all of us. Mm. And it's not just a local thing, it's not just a German thing, it's not a European thing, it's a planetary thing. And that is something that I would say is very positive about it. Yeah, I, I don't think that, it's wonderful to hear that, and I don't think, I think it's in full agreement with what we've been saying. We need to recognize the trouble, but look for the hope as well, and that story the possibility of, a, of good Anthropocene futures is an incredibly powerful, motivating force. Yeah, and also that, that realization, um, you know, I, I look back on my childhood and I miss all sorts of things that are no longer around. I miss various shopping centers that have gone. I miss, you know, Vesta paella in paella and curry, you know, these, these bizarre foods that I had. I miss, you know, I miss Arctic rolls and, and, and uh, tinned ravioli. Uh, and actually, not, not really the rev that last <laughs> one. But... Um, <laughs> I also miss the plenitude that I experienced as a child growing up in a place where there was a, I mean, a meadow completely full of life. Um, and it took me a long time to realize that those are different kinds of mourning. You can mourn the casualties of fast capitalism because you know they'll be replaced by new things for new generations of a similar order, but it's a different kind of mourning to mourn things that have been lost uh, in the environment. Um, and I think that that loss is happening no matter what generation one is in. It's, it's just still happening. You know, it's, it's, as you say, it's shifting baseline. So, um, yeah. So categories of and ty typologies of, of loss seem really important here, that, that we don't just, that we don't have a single unsubtleized grief, that there, that there are forms of, of grief. I don't know if either of you wants to add to, to that. I so a poem by Norman McCaig, I think, which uh, a poet, Helen Mort, mentioned earlier, and he says, where are our dictionaries of, of the leaves, of grasses? And I think we just need more dictionaries, don't we? We need more words. We do. I also think we need to 
sit down in front of bulldozers. I mean, <laughs> just, here, here. It's just such I agree. Yeah. And that might take a lot of people. I mean, talk of building another Bosphorus channel. Huge. That's going to take a lot of people sitting down in front of bulldozers. These things are vast, but I do think act, active, active manoeuvres on the ground are needed. Um, I'll just add that I'm part of a uh, newly formed something called the Loose L-U-C-E Anthropocene Working Group, which is bringing together 15 interdisciplinary people. I think one of them is Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, who's been mentioned earlier. And, uh, well, we're basically... And there's environmental lawyers, there's sinologists, there's post-colonial specialists. Uh, uh, and we're, we're going to spend try over the next three years a series of, of meetings over quite long periods of time to, to work out good Anthropocene scenarios and come up with, with possible ways of moving forwards. I um, wanted to just, it's not really a question, but just get sort of a bit of feedback. Um, Helen, you mentioned quite a few times about bearing witness or exposure, all these words. We're talking about activism, sitting in front of bulldozers, all this, so being there in the present. But I wondered what your um, thoughts are on modern travel and the fact that most of us, myself included, got here by plane. Um, and we know that the impact that that has on climate change. Um, so sometimes I feel like bearing witness is very important, but also maybe I would be better to stay at home um, and no, not travel uh, to come to conferences, conferences like this. Yes, that's, that's uh, absolutely the case. Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I am a terrible hypocrite and have been for the last couple of years. Um, I have been flying. You know, I've told myself initially that because I don't have kids, you know, it kind of evens it out, but that's just rubbish. Um, yeah, I'm going to think very carefully about that in the future. I mean, I, I, you know, you got here by, by train, right? That's what I should have done. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, guilty as charged. Um, and yet, you know, I've told myself too that traveling and talking to people about the environment does its bit. Um, but I, yeah, it's a reckoning. It's a reckoning. It's a, it's a, it's a math, bit of mathematics I have to to work on. I think um, we all need to be given permission in a way. If, well, I'm, I'm quite an obedient person, so I need to be given permission. So I'm grateful that the British Council, when I said, demanded yeah. that I, I came by train, that they, they were um, willing to yeah. look it's into it. It's often that. not an option. And I, I think yeah. we need to know as writers that when we do public events, we can, we can ask um, to travel in different ways. And I think also it's, it's wonderful that this is being um, broadcast online so that yeah. people don't have to fly to be here and I think hopefully this will become much more common um, and we just need to keep that as a possibility in the That's public a much eye. better answer thank you oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm said. not I'm not guilty so <laughs> I can <laughs> I'm always guilty I mean, that's why I'm working guilty. on albatrosses I don't know if it sounds like buck passing but I think there are kind of personal responsibilities which I, I really think everyone is is People are beginning to act more responsibly and they're being encouraged to do so, but then there are greater political solutions as well, which we are not detached from, of course, but, uh, mm. you know, where are the developments in sort of cleaner fuel, aviation, fluid, uh, are these being developed? These That's are true. questions. I mean, it's, it's not just about we don't buy a ticket to get on a plane. It is about we don't buy a ticket to get on a plane, but uh, the layers of responsibility are vast. They, they reach a long way. Um. I'll just say two very quick things, then we better stop. The first is that I, when we began this, I said to the British Council, look, we're going to bring a lot of people in a very energy-intensive way together here to talk about um, many shades of green. And if we're going to do this, we need to do this as best we can. I said, no single-use plastic. Uh, give the option of train travel where possible. Um, please push the whole thing through the best environmental audit that you can. And they, they've done that, and I'm grateful to them. Inevitably, of course, it is still a massively energy-intensive um, endeavor. The second thing I would say is a much bigger question, which is that it is extremely in the interests of corporations, governments, and a neoliberal worldview to displace the possibilities of change onto the individual. The individual is the guilt maker, and the individual is the change maker. That is true. We can change as individuals, but actually, there is, there is a huge vested interest in making us think that our individual actions are the ones that will make the difference in aggregation. 
They will, and we need to do that too. But actually, the change needed is so vast that it's, it's structural, it's, it's, it's systemic. And as long as we keep thinking that we are the ones who can fix it with our individual actions, then I think systemic change will always slip away. So, okay, all right, thank you very much. Well, of course you're correcting what you're saying, but then you're not at the same time, because there is no such thing as a structure as such, is that all the decisions are made by being humans, and these humans are you and me and other people like you and me. And of course, every decision that every single one of us makes at every single instant does have an, in, uh, does have an impact. And it's, um, it's not about guilt, it's about being aware of your responsibility, every single one's. So it's not, just don't push that away and don't say this no, no. is a structural thing. I wasn't, I wasn't saying no, 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 I, either I know or. you were yeah. not, but we I think it's, 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 it's important to emphasize that as well. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, if, I, if I gave the impression that I was saying do what you like, no. as long as the government's changed, that yeah. wasn't the case at all. But I, I think that the, the simplification of change into an individual behavioral narrative is very much in the interests of, of large power structures and, and that clearly change can happen in that way and must continue to happen in that way and pressure must be brought and hearts and minds must be changed. But that to see that that is the only means by which change will come is to me absolves higher powers. Which are constituted by individuals. Like Volkswagen? Yeah, well, That's not the individual. No, but you, you still have, even Volkswagen, you have individual people responsible for their actions in, within Volkswagen, and that's what I'm trying to emphasize. Not like. <laughs> no, they should be. They're not, do, n they're not up to that. I, I do agree with that completely. That's not the point. It's just that we have to be aware of that, that every single person on this planet is responsible for their actions. Should we carry this on for one or two more minutes? I think let's just while there's a little bit of energy, let's go back to let's have this uh, young younger voice as the <laughs> well, as not, the last not voice. actually that young anymore, <laughs> but below thirty. Um, I kind of get both of your points, and I would like to um, add a bit more to yours to maybe explain it better. It's like when you put the responsibility on the individual too much. Um, it's not a thing that one individual can do by themselves. If you try to change your life and you try to become a person who is more environmentally conscious, what do you do? You're, first and foremost, you're a consumer. So you go to the supermarket and you try to find brands that are less harmful than the ones you've been consuming before. How do you do that? You look at the labels. The labels lie to you. It consumes a whole amount of time and energy to find out which products you can buy that are more ethically correct than others. And in the present day working environment, most people just don't have that time. It's not possible for them. They have children, they have a household to take care of. How are they gonna manage to each individually for themselves find out which products to boycott? It just doesn't work that way. This is why we need to abolish supermarkets, for instance. You can go to, to a market, you can join um, a solidarity agriculture where you get the produce directly from the farmers. Those are things that need to be systemic because people just won't do that out of their own accord if they don't know about it, if they don't have the time to get informed about it. Just to, just to butt in, I, I, I have a friend many years ago who was extremely environmentally responsible. Um, tried to buy local, bought organic. He worked for an oil company. So, you know, I don't know. I, I absolutely agree with you about that. It's difficult, particularly, and also particularly in terms of privilege, in terms of time. Um, so I think... Well, political doesn't... systems. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's very hard for some people to, to activate, you know, to go and protest. It's expensive, it's expensive and it's dangerous. Very dangerous. Okay, that seems like a good word to end on. Um, thanks everyone for the energy and passion and vigor and force of, of the session. Thanks particularly to Helen Sarah.